Good morning, everyone. This is the May 20th meeting of the Elementary School Building Committee. And the um, we have a quite full agenda today, but one of the first things I need to do is make sure that everyone can, of the committee members can see, hear us and be heard. And so I will call out the names as I see them on the screen. And I want to note that we will be missing a few people today of our members today. Um, Rupert had let us know in advance that he could not be here. And Margaret Wood is not here, but Bob Stevens from Answer will be. Um, he doesn't look exactly like Margaret, but Bob, Bob, Bob will play Margaret's role today. And I, I think Mike might not be able to join us because there was a tragic accident last night um, that involved high school students. So with that said, I'm going to call out on uh, names of the committee member and please indicate whether you can hear and be heard. Sean? Yes. Paul? Yes. Ben? Yes. Phoebe? Yes, thank you. Allison? This is Allison. Hi, Allison. Tammy? Simone? Yes. Jonathan? Here. And Alicia? Here. And Jonathan told us early that he's going to be uh, Jonathan Salvin in print on the screen rather than in face because he's doing double, du du double duty. Um, so with, with that um, sort of short introduction, I'd like Bob Stevens to put the agenda up um, for today. As committee members know, we have two main items. Um, the first will be Donna and Danisco summarizing what we've all seen and the basis of design um, and talking a little bit about what the role is that. And these estimates are due back um, we're going to get estimates from two estimators that do back on May 31st. So at our next meeting, we will, on June 3rd, we will be getting new cost estimates um, with quite a bit of detail. Um, so Donna will lead off with that. And we're hoping that will be mainly um, a, a summary to leave most of the time for the committee to start discussing options and priorities and Jonathan and several other people sent in comments on the criteria matrix. So um, I've asked Bob Answer to be a facilitator for that discussion. And he has the matrix where people talked about priorities in terms of what criteria are particularly important to people. And so um, we'll have a discussion on that and then really go around the room to the extent we have a room in Zoom. Just not making choices, but really saying positive attributes, negative, any remaining questions um, that we have. Because if you look at our schedule, we are, when we meet again on June 3rd, we will be receiving the new cost estimates and I'm hoping we can um, schedule that if people, people can put it on their calendars for potentially going till 11 in the morning, because we, we need as much time as possible to make sure we understand the estimates and hope and potentially start filling out the matrix. And uh, one, of, one of the things I wanna do today when we finish our discussion is suggest that everyone take the matrix out as homework assignment and start seeing whether there are some things that seem clearly better as they look across, meaning a green color or however you wanna do better, some that don't look as good. And then anything you can't assess, just leave blank. You know, if it's, things look about the same because I think some of our criteria don't vary much across the options because from June 3rd right now, we are scheduled to meet again as a committee, not until June 13th, where we have to pick a preferred option. So I, I'm gonna ask people both at the end of the meeting, but also by email, whether we could potentially schedule one more meeting between the 3rd and the 13th, which would be the week of the 9th, um, to make sure we have enough time to, um, 
really have a robust discussion on reaching the preferred option because Donesco will have to write up our rationale for what ended up being the most choice. So, so if people can be ready, I will send out, I wanna coordinate with a few people to make sure I, dates I offer work for me and others. But that week of June 9th, um, if we could squeeze in at least one a one hour meeting. At that point, we will have all the information we're gonna have. We'll have the cost estimates, we'll have the traffic studies and everything else. Um, so that's um, an end of meeting. I'll remind this, but uh, that's as a potential. So with that introduction, Donna, I think I'm going to just turn it over to you. And, awesome. then, and then we'll be back to a committee discussion. Sounds Thank you. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just Kathy, for clarification for the cost estimates, we have a reconciliation meeting on May 31st. We have two estimators. And so we spent some time going through the estimates, making sure that um, both estimators understand the scope. There may be some tweaking, modifications. So um, just to manage and set expectations, we will not have them issued on the 31st. They may have to go back and modify their estimates based on our conversations. So we're hoping to be able to issue them on, you know, probably end of day June 1st. So I, I just want I just want to make sure everyone understands that. Um, and then before we jump into the basis of design, we're just going to um, do a quick overview of what was included. We appreciate everyone's comments, but to follow up on um, staff input, we had the session that was, uh, geez, that was a couple of weeks ago. And I believe that um, the school department had the meeting or we scheduled the meeting during school hours, uh, canceled all other meetings in hopes that other people that we would receive as many staff to join the meeting. Uh, we didn't have a huge turnout, but what we did in response to that was we put up the presentation. We also put up the video of the presentation and a survey to all of the staff um, as, a, as another means or another way of soliciting input. We didn't get a whole lot of responses. We got nine um, out of, um, I, I guess, the entire district. I'll just quickly summarize what we heard. Uh, as several people said that they liked the most compact three-story option with the community assets or community spaces in the front. There was a lot of special ed staff who weighed in on it and they're great, they're advocates for their, um, for their children. They like the integrated SPED as related to the concept one new school option. They were concerned about the number of spaces for specialists, et cetera. Um, but other than that, there you know, wasn't a whole lot. One, one staff member still felt that we need to find another means to obtain additional input from staff. Um, so maybe maybe someone can help us advocate. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, um, but anyway, so I just wanted to give everyone a quick um, update on that. And then what I'm going to do is actually turn it over to Tim, if that's OK. And he has the presentation. And, and Donna, just I want to make sure I see Angelica has joined us. Angelica, could you just indicate that, that you're here and you can be heard? Here. OK, thank you very much. So I'm going to share yeah, my exactly. screen and we're going to do a brief summary of what was included in the basis of design with some uh, pictures to go along with it to give a feel. Starting with the purpose of the estimates at this phase, they are to allow us to make an informed decision or you to make an informed decision about um, between the alternatives. Uh, they just find the general building elements um, that will meet the town requirements in terms of durability, performance, and the educational program. Uh, but the budgets are based on a basis of design, not a design itself. So materials and quantities that are identified are not final in any way. But 
the building and the basis of design as described currently reflect MSBA projects, public school buildings in Massachusetts and a standard of fit and finish that you would expect. When we get these estimates back, they will allow us to determine a preliminary construction cost for the project, which, and that will allow us to develop soft costs for a total project budget. And with these numbers, we can develop an anticipated preliminary level of participation from the MSBA in the total project cost. And so just going through what was included, um, starting big picture and narrowing it a little bit with the site, uh, both sites have soil modifications for the building itself uh, to deal with the soil conditions. They both include rammed aggregate piers. They both include drainage around the building at Fort River. Uh, they include drainage below the building. There is surface level stormwater management across the site. And then there are all of the site elements to deal with the program of the school. Um, 175 parking spaces, outdoor play spaces, playground equipment, bike racks, all of the elements that will allow the site to function. Um, there are also the canopy PVs that will support the schools and the town's uh, net zero energy goals. Um, one of the other differences between the sites, there are allowances for retaining walls at the Wildwood site. The only other thing I'd like to add is um, some, and some of the questions came up that as we haven't developed the sites because we don't have a preferred solution and haven't had, we're, we're not at that level, we are allowing for allowances or lump sums for some of the outdoor play equipment, outdoor learning and, and alike. So, so um, we don't have specifics. What we're allowing for is adequate and appropriate based on our experience and our landscape architects experience. Um, moving into the design of the building, it'll be a steel framed building with a uh, steel stud backup construction for the exterior walls. Um, continuous insulation in the cavities with veneer masonry around and accent panels of composite metal or some other material. Um, there will be thermally broken aluminum windows and curtain wall. And uh, at this page, we are estimating 23% of the walls will be windows or curtain wall uh, with a PVC roof. Um, and then the thermal performance of the building will be a, an R25 for the walls and R40 for the roof. The mechanical systems of the building, the basis for all the options is a ground source seat pump with air source and VRF distribution as an alternate. It's a, for the ground source, it's a four pipe induction system or chill beam that will allow heating and cooling at the same time as the building demands. Um, all electric building, domestic hot water, kitchen, um, automated to the extent that is required by the facilities department, uh, be fully sprinkled elevator, all of the systems that you would expect in a 21st century school. And there will be roof mounted PVs to augment the canopy mounted PDs to meet the energy goals of the school. Moving into the spaces that are occupied by the students and the finishes uh, in the corridors, as in most of the building, you will have linoleum floor, um, wainscot tiles for durability in the corridors and high traffic areas, the tile will go higher. Uh, the walls above the tile will be painted GWB. Um, plaster wall board um, ceilings will generally be acoustic ceiling tiles and accents with clouds drop down and some wood look ceilings off of the corridors. The toilets will have full height ceramic tile Moving into the classrooms, uh, doors will be hardwood with large side lights to let walls into the corridors through the classroom. Uh, ceilings will still be acoustic. In every classroom, there will be two sinks and there will be storage built in for uh, all of the elements required for the education. And then there's technology in every classroom. Um, 
speech reinforcement um, projection or a smart screen. There are spaces off of the corridors, um, project areas that allow pull out learning and individual instruction um, in those spaces outside of the classrooms. There will be additional storage, uh, casework, veneer wood, and then also lockers for students. Some of the additional classrooms like the art and science and technology and engineering room are similar fit and finish to the classrooms. Uh, there will be additional built in storage, uh, pendant lighting that is indirect and direct, which is efficient and provides even levels of light throughout the classrooms. And then attached to the art program, there will be additional storage and a kiln. In the cafeteria, there will be a raised platform, hardwood finish construction, um, an AV system, not full theater system, but enough for the performances that you would expect in an elementary school, an operable partition that will enclose the stage so it can be used as an additional teaching space, and a full service kitchen adjacent to the cafeteria with serving lines. The library uh, will be the only space in the building with carpet. Um, there will be built-in shelving, indirect lighting, and ceiling accents as you would have in some of the other spaces of the building. There will also be circulation desk and speech reinforcement for some of the instruction that happens in the library. The gymnasium will have a hardwood floor as base, CMU walls for de durability, um, and then tectum panels above that, which control the acoustics in the room. Um, and then a dividing curtain so that the gym can be used by two sections at the same time. Um, and then all of the sports equipment uh, that you would expect, uh, basketball hoops, volleyball nets. Um, and other play equipment. So none of the materials specified or quantities are final, but they will provide um, the information to the estimators to develop their estimates to the extent that they will need to for you to make your decision at this point. So Kathy, I, I think that's it, right, Tim? We're done? That is it. Yeah. So um, we appreciate everyone's thoughtful comments and, and we circulated the responses to the questions. So great minds think alike. I think there are a lot of same questions. So you might see some of the answers repeated. Some of the questions were asked slightly differently, but um, that pretty much, um, I, I guess, unless anyone else has any further questions to the ones that were asked, uh, maybe Kathy, if that's okay, we can just see if anyone has any additional oh, questions. Absolutely. So if anyone has any further questions, I know a lot, we posted a lot of material, both the extensive basis of design that was sent out. And then we, um, I forwarded every comment I got. Um, and we got several that from non-committee members, public that's really been avid, actively following it. And all of those are posted as well. Um, so I'm looking for any hands get up. And, and one thing I know I had asked early on as we're doing this, this is the, once we pick the preferred, this is just a beginning. So I was asking, you know, the colors, what does the furniture look like? Um, you know, exactly what, it, and, and my understanding is, We've got um, cost estimates where if you switch a color, if you decide something's going to little be a different, have some variations, all of that is still to come, in, including the kinds of things I know Angelica, we talked about with a, once there's more of a shell of a building, that's when you can really get staff and people saying, you know, I like this better or that better. None of, none of that has been decided, but this core, these core elements are needed to even get a decent estimate at this point. So I, I just was one, I was like, when do we do that? And that's, yeah. it's coming. <laughs> rather it is than coming. coming, it is coming. 
Yeah. We should get the other ones up. So I'm just looking. Um, I don't want to say much more on this. So I don't see any hands up. Angelica has her hand up. Oh, Angelica. Okay. That's right. Yeah. It's in the bookcase. I guess it's, uh, you touched on my question. I just want to double check and make sure because this is, uh, I know that some things are to come, but just in terms of design and accessibility for disability concerns, like basic designs related uh, along accessibility uh, of toilets, of, you know, like things that might be part of the cost estimates as well that were concerns with the elementary school. I just want to make sure that is still to come or that is something that we can discuss now. Because um, you mentioned things like speech reinforcement and things like cafeteria seating. And, you know, just there's a lot of right. questions I have in terms of accessibility regarding so, that. Yeah, sure, Angelica, and thank you. And again, similar to, um, you know, what, what we hear from teachers are we want some, you know, the windows that open or, or heat, those, those are givens to us. Um, so, so as is accessibility, every, every space in the building will be ex accessible, um, including toilet rooms, including, um, that's why we actually have two sinks in the classrooms is so that one can even be fully accessible and the other one can be used for deep sinks. So the um, entire school will be accessible and, and, and into the school and the play yard. So, so the, the whole project will be accessible. And the speech reinforcement, you know, helps with hearing impaired students and, and it's just for overall um, health and benefits of staff and, and students. Phoebe, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I have a couple of, uh, I think, more simple questions. Um, I didn't see under slab drainage at Wildwood in your presentation, but I thought that there was under slab drainage needed still there as well. Is that correct? I thought I saw it in one of the things that we had gotten. There is not under slab drainage at Wildwood is included at Fort River. Um, based on the best uh, advice of our geotech and civil engineers so far, and we will be collecting a lot more data. Um, this is what we are carried um, as we get further into detail. Um, we can verify that those assumptions are correct, but currently okay. we are not carrying under slab drainage at Wildwood because we do not think it is necessary. Okay, I think I had just seen it in the PDP, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, in terms of the allowances, will the allowances be indicated that they are allowances within the budget? Are they going to be categorized separately? How are we gonna know what's an allowance versus this, um, you know, sort of a more? Yes, the, the, they'll say lump sum. They'll say LS lump sum and, and the value, like, um, you know, playground equipment. I, I think we were carrying 300,000 okay. or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my, my last question at the moment <laughs> um, is the, so I, I know that you guys got a lot of, uh, I, I sent a whole list of questions. I know that you guys had mentioned that there were other questions and comments and all of that that had come in. Um, my guess is that they came in on the day that you submitted what you had to the cost estimators. Um, so I, I guess what I'm wondering is how will those things be handled? How will they be dealt with? Um, in my mind, I think there were a couple of, you know, sort of larger ticket items. And given that, you know, here we are in Amherst and that some of these things could add up to very large dollar amounts um, that were not included, how are those things going to get accounted for before the time that we have to make sort of an informed, a realistically informed decision on which site um, we wanna have this school on. Yep, so, so any questions that we receive, Phoebe, that we did not carry or specify, or we wanted to clarify with the cost estimators, we've sent those along. So if someone brought something to our attention, a couple of things were typos, such as we were carrying gas, boiler instead of uh, electric or hot water heater. Um, we, we made those clarifications to make sure that the cost estimates reflected those. If there's a specific question that you may have um, that you're pointing to, um, maybe you could point it out, but anything in the questions that we received from everyone, 
anything that impacted costs that we missed or was an oversight, we made sure the cost estimator as we see. And I just want to point out there was an addendum. Tim sent an addendum, and the addendum was sent to the cost estimators. That's in the package. Correct. And they worked actually. People got them their questions pretty fast, and Dinesco worked fast on the other side to incorporate anything that was either a clarification um, or a, a piece. And and just just. Again, for a point of reference, when we go through the reconciliation meeting, we really do go through every section or every element and make sure that the estimators have picked up all of our comments and, and clarifications. So it's a dialogue that also occurs during this reconciliation meeting. So I don't think I'm seeing any other hands up. So I'd, I'd like to turn to uh, what I hope will be just really the committee talking to each other. Um, and I've asked Bob Stevens to be the facilitator. So I am not a chair. I am just one of 13 people. And I don't have to look at hands. He can, he can call on hands. And I think, um, you know, we, we asked Jonathan if he was willing to lead off. Bob is going to show the, um, the uh, uh, our matrix. And Bob, if you can, great. So what, one of the things that was sent in to us um, and people were asked about is here's a matrix that we're going to be using as a tool. Which of the criteria are particularly important. So getting heavy weighting, uh, top priority. And um, I just wanna ask Jonathan, and then I'm turning it over to Bob because I have some comments because Jonathan said he was willing to lead off on this discussion. He told Margaret he was willing to. So Bob, I'm turning it over to you and I am now joining the crowd. Okay, thank you. Well, I'll turn it right back to Jonathan. I understand that, Jonathan, you had some recent comments and thoughts about uh, priorities. And if sure. you could uh, talk about your thoughts, maybe the rest of the committee can then uh, can then uh, offer their comments. Sure. Can everyone hear me? just want to make sure that since I'm on my phone that I can be still be heard. Yeah, I think it we're, at least I'm seeing heads nodding, Jonathan. Great. So uh, my thought when I was looking at the criteria of this uh, earlier this week was, you know, which, which, which one of these cat, many of these categories are important to demonstrate that, um, you know, that we, that this was an important issue. Um, it was something that we were considering or, or felt impacted the design, but for a lot of them, they didn't vary much. And so I was looking uh, at the list from that perspective, where, where were we going to see variants? Um, for some of them, how would we assess them? because um, some weren't straightforward to me, which at a certain level I think is fine. It's just it, it was getting trying to get me to, myself to think about how to think about them as it were. Um, and then which ones did I think should be weighted more heavily and, and other people are going to have different opinions about this, but sort of highlighted in green um, in that that column H or were the the ones that that um, I felt maybe it had more weight than than others and might also help to kind of differentiate between uh, the, the, the four or six that we have to kind of work our way through, um, two sites, you know, three, three types of buildings. Um, and so with that preamble, I can, I can give folks my thoughts. Um, so the first couple here at the top, and Bob, I can't see if you're scrolling. But, can, you, um, can, can everybody see that clearly? Yeah, we, we've got a matrix, Jonathan, and we're seeing right. the top up to um, through the equity transition. So we have your okay. first two green areas. Bob, right. can, can you maximize it? With yep. a little... Is that better? Yes. So I, I'm going to go to the ones I thought might carry more weight. And if folks want me to talk about some of the others, I can, but I, I think given the amount of uh, time we have and, and, uh, and the, you know, giving everybody a chance to talk, I'll just focus on those. So the first one I thought was an important one uh, was the optimizes energy efficiency. Um, I, I, you know, I think uh, there should be a little bit of variance still between the different options between, you know, 
new construction and renovation. Um, and this also felt like a really important one since we've got to get to net zero. Um, but we also want to be good stewards for the town in the long term. Um, the next one that I thought should be weighted a little bit more heavily uh, was uh, provides uh, flexibility for future enrollment growth. Um, and in, in my head, at least, this was kind of both a building and potentially a site uh, criteria. Um, I don't necessarily, I have not actually, you know, thought in my own head about which ones might be more uh, adaptable, but I think that's an important category. Um, then the next one was it maximizes efficient utilization of the site, which I guess is, is sort of similar to that last one in some ways. Um, then there's, you know, there's a, a number here that between that and the next one that I highlighted in green that I'm just curious about how, thinking about how to assess them. Um, uh, and then there's some that, you know, obviously all of them are going to, to meet, like provides sufficient parking. That's, that should be a prerequisite for, for any of the designs. Uh, let's see, where have I missed? Um, you missed, um, Bob's got, got us seeing it from the top. So you have total, yeah. total costs and- ah, total uh, cost. Total cost and uh, minimized construction duration. I apologize, I had scrolled, <laughs> I had scrolled further down, but I'm doing this from my own screen, but yes. Obviously, total product costs is, is, is an important one. I think everyone would agree that, that that's going to be a major consideration. Um, and for me, uh, minimizes construction duration uh, is, is important um, so that kids can get into the new learning space as, as quick as possible. And I think there'll be some variance between the, the various uh, designs on that. And then, uh, yeah. So Bob, maybe can you yeah, scroll can down to, to see if we're missing any other of his greens? Yeah, I think the next the next green I think maybe we didn't talk about was uh, minimize the student impact during construction. Yes, that, that one also seemed important because in some of these, uh, you know, the kids will, uh, kids are gonna be on site during the whole construction and which which ones, are less impactful to the students and the, and the educators. Um, that seems like a differentiating point to me, um, and and a fairly important one. Despite the fact I did this backwards, I think that's all of them. I think that is. I think the other ones you have talked about. So, um, Jonathan, if that's your summary, does anybody have any comments or thoughts? Agree or things to add? Angela, Angelica's hands up, Bob. Uh, can you, her hand goes up in the corner by her bookcase, so. Okay, Angelica, uh, I don't see her on my screen at the moment. Yeah, but. thanks. Um, so I, I really appreciate um, the, this, uh, your priorities. And I just wanted to ask if like, as you listed them, they're your ordered priorities. That is to say the first ones that you listed are what you would consider things to be um, weighed more heavily because you listed first optimizes energy efficient and then provides flexibility or uh, how do you think um, we should weigh them between these? Cause I have listed about six different categories that are really helpful to think through. For, for me, I don't know that I necessarily um, have a, have have listed them in, in a specific order. I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I, I was reading off my own screen here. And so I, I, list, I read them in the order that I saw them. Um, you know, I, I think for me, all of these have more weight than, than some of the others where it's either gonna be harder to assess um, or, or really where there's not gonna be a lot of difference. Um, I, in the end, uh, you know, if I had to pick two top ones that were important to me, it would probably be um, uh, optimizes the, you know, the energy efficiency, um, probably cost. And then least, destru least disruption to, to staff and students. I guess that's three, not two. Um, those would be my highest priorities. But again, that's kind of a, a personal perspective. Any other comments? Um, can you, 
Bob, can you see there are two hands up? There are actually three hands up. Sean, mine, the hands go up in the corner of the screen. Yeah, I, I do see them. I'm just not seeing everybody at once. Um, so um, Sean, then would you, would you care to comment next? Sure. Um, so I did the same thing Jonathan did, and I think I'll just, I'll add two to the list that uh, everything he stated in terms of weighting heavily, I think I agree with. Um, the two that he didn't state that I felt were important as well um, were traffic, because I think that varied um, between the sites um, and might be a differentiator. And uh, educational benefits from location adjacencies, I think, is also different between the sites. So I think all the ones Jonathan identified make sense to me, um, and I would add those too. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathy, you had comments? Uh, yeah, um, I, when I, I actually started to try to use this matrix, and so one of Jonathan's comments I wanna just uh, focus on for a minute. I was trying to find things that I thought would vary. So equity is an extremely important value to me, but I looked at the enrollment in the school. We have two schools that are quite similar in terms of percent of low income, BIPOC, special needs kids, or English language learners, um, walkability, and some of the other measures. I didn't see much variation. So I ended up not having that as one of my more heavily because when I tried to do it, I wasn't getting this one's better on this, this one's worse on it. So that point he made about, it didn't seem to vary much. It's in really important, but it doesn't vary. So it wouldn't help us distinguish among them. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. And then the other one, um, just on a, as people start to look at this, Jonathan pointed out, um, or uh, someone else in comments that we have, two ways of saying minimizing duration. One is that children can move in in the fall of 2026. And the other one says minimize construction dur duration. They're basically the same. You know, we're, we're being told both new buildings we could get in by 2026. So on a couple of these, I just wanted to eliminate one. So, because I think that's really important and I would just pick one of them. And I didn't have a strong preference on which one. So I, I just wanted to make those points because when I went down them, things I thought were relatively important. I don't think we have a good measure of them or I didn't think uh, they're gonna vary. Yeah, so I'll stop there. Okay, uh, Phoebe, you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I... I um... For me, the outdoor space, learning opportunities, that kind of stuff is always heavily weighted. Um, I, cost, of course, is heavily weighted for me. Um, my concern goes back to, do we have all the cost information that we're going to need by the time that we need to make a decision about these two schools? So I, I'm, I you know, don't want to keep harping on that today, but I'm going <laughs> to. Um, uh, least disruptive, I think is, is really important because we have kids and staff and, you know, everybody needs to be in what we have existing while this is going on. And because I have, uh, you know, minor knowledge of construction, it is hugely, hugely disruptive in general. And we're talking about, you know, within yards <laughs> of, uh, where our kids are, are going to be in school currently. Um, the, the things that I didn't see on here, and I don't know, uh, one of the big things that I somehow got lost, because I know Kathy and you and I talked about it when we were going through this, you know, a month or whatever ago, um, has to do with uh, future use of the building that isn't, that is not going to be chosen. So we had talked about it not as a uh, you know, sort of we had added it down to the bottom because I think that especially right now, I'm seeing more conversation about that, public comment coming in about that as a decision-making factor. Um, so I think that that's something that we at least have to 
add somewhere along the line. Um, I'm, I'm hearing uh, conversations that maybe we need to have or that we do need to have just a little bit as a committee. Um, and so I think that we, I, I think that that needs to make it in here somewhere. Um, you know, maybe it's not going to be a, a primary measure that we use to decide between one building or another or one location or another, um, but it's something that the, that the general you know, community is talking about and therefore we need to be having this conversation as well. We have to do this all above board and out in the open. Um, so uh, I wanna add that. I also didn't see anywhere um, about, uh, you know, maybe it is in here and I just kind of glazed over it, but the uh, access to the outside, how people get from in the building to out of the building, the, the number of exits and entrances, and maybe that's because it's going to be the same, but I'd like a little clarity on that. Okay. Thank you. Paul, let me you just, Bob, I just want to raise, there is a criteria, Phoebe, on a, um, easy access to the outside. So um, it, it's listed, it's, it hasn't been a, a optimizing connection to the outer doors. That may not be worded in the way you're talking about. I just want to say there is one like that. Um, okay. Kathy, I don't um, know if it's appropriate just to um, answer some of Phoebe's questions now uh, as it relates to that as well, or we want to just table it all. Um, why don't we? I, I think you should answer them. Yeah, go okay. for it. All right, great. Um, so um, two things on cost. Um, again, uh, we don't have a design. And so we actually, and Bob's here, and um, Margaret would also probably say that the level of detail that we have presented at this phase of the project is actually quite more than we would normally give at this point. We don't have a design. So we're comfortable um, with the site, and, and we understand site carries a lot of weight, right? A lot of cost. So, so we, we dug deep, no pun intended, on the site, and, and we feel comfortable with the site requirements for, for either site for the buildings. The building itself is, you know, again, um, what we typically would provide, not just us, but for mass K public K-12 buildings. So the nuances are going to um, be slight as we start moving forward as it relates to finishes and materials. And, you know, um, we are meeting your net zero requirements. So we're confident there that there are not going to be any surprises. Uh, so, so the cost is the cost. This is what, what we have to work with now. Um, the only caveat I say to all of this, if anyone is reading the news, the cost of construction is going through the roof. So we're going to do our best to forecast what the market is going to bring, and there's no guarantees um, on, on how we can manage that. But these are based on all the information that we currently have. As far as access to the outdoors, that really comes with the final solution. But um, the design isn't complete. So a renovation addition is gonna have different accesses to the outdoors than a new construction. But we'll, we'll continue to work with the committee as we actually start designing the project. I, I hope that helps. Okay. Um, can we move on to some other comments? Yes. Uh, Paul, I think you had your hand up. Do um, so. I was, I had some of the same questions that Phoebe had, so that's why I was hoping to get to have Donna address them. So thank you for doing that. Um, I have a few thoughts on this right at this moment in time. So I think first off, we as a committee are going to have to be prepared to make some decisions with imperfect information. It's just at the stage of the project where we are, we're not going to have full and complete information about every item. So I think that's we're just going to have to sort of be prepared for that. I think that. Um, when I look at this matrix, it seems like a lot of the um, items are going to be um, applicable, applicable to both schools, you know, in terms of um, both locations, or it's going to be, a, or there'll be minor differences. And when I look at the decision making on this, we are looking at a 50 year decision about what is in the best interest of the town for the next 50 years. 
And that is, that's the biggest, that's one of the biggest things that's weighing for me is that what is the best interest, what's the best location for the school, for the town, for the next 50 years. The number one component of that for me with my hat on as town manager is cost. I think uh, we're all identifying cost as being a driver in this and it's going to get worse and um, we're gonna have to make hard decisions along the way. So cost is a, a very high level of, um, of, of um, value for me. Um, and I think it's, it, you know, we, there's so many unknowns with cost. So we have to have that from my perspective, uh, first and foremost. Um, again, with my, I, I don't look at the educational pieces of it because that's not my area of expertise. We do have educators on the committee who will bring that perspective. My other perspective is about traffic and the impact um, on traffic and um, adjacent roads and um, what it does to our traffic patterns in town, which, uh, you know, as we look at this, that's a high value one for me. Um, I also is a lot, sort of along the same word, long lines, I think about walkability, um, how many students are served by walking to school. I think part of our whole goal is to create great pathways for people to get to school by walking and whichever site maximizes the use of walking, I think would be a high value for a higher, not the highest value cost is always the highest for me, but that that's an important value for me because I think, um, just down the road, I think the more people we can have walking to school, the better off we are in terms of everything, the environment, um, health, everything. Um, you know, I hadn't really, you know, I was, I hadn't really factored in uh, future use of the site. And I think, you know, I think Phoebe, you're right that that is becoming a conversation. So I don't know how to factor that in. Um, I mean, it's, we should have that conversation about, sh should that be a, a factor or not? Um, because that is, once the site is, what the other site is done with, it goes to uh, the town council to decide basically what to do with it. So um, I'm not sure how to factor that in for our discussion purposes, um, but I think it is something that the public is interested in talking about or thinking about. So I think there's some value to that. Um, and, um, and then the other thing is the, um, that I don't know exactly how to value so much uh, is the adjacencies. I forget where that is on the, on the chart. Um, uh, the values of adjacencies versus um, having a separate building. Those are, that's the sort of biggest difference between the two. One is adjacent to an educational complex and one is not. Um, and is how much value is there to this campus model versus not. So those are the types of things I'm thinking about. I think a lot of the other ones, and you know, energy efficiency is obviously a high priority, but I feel like whichever site we choose, we're gonna hit that. You know, that, that's why I think about some of these criteria. Um, you know, we hope that the design is going to have ample outdoor learning opportunities, that there's gonna be access to outdoors, that there's going to be light, that both designs are gonna make those priorities, but that, you know, in terms of choose, right now, we're trying to decide which is the right site for us to have this building that's going to be there for the next 50 years. Um, that's the type of, this is, this is where my thinking is at this moment in time. I think I hit everything from my notes. Thank you. Any follow-up um, comments to Paul's thoughts? I think we've gotten a pretty good cross-section of feedback on uh, Jonathan's, uh, Jonathan's comments. So um, I would propose to move on to another topic if, if we can agree on that. Um, and that would be some discussion about ad rental versus new. Kathy, would this be something you'd like to jump in on? Sure, I, I can. Um, and I'm going to try to do it in the context of what we've been talking about as priorities. Um, um, I've been, actually, I, I think I go to sleep with this every night and I wake up in the middle of the night, keep thinking, because I think we have difficult choices. So an ad reno, um, I think we have quite a good design, um, you know, in terms of what it could look like. And the preliminary cost estimates that we received indicated it would be somewhat less. And when I say somewhat, you know, few million, we're in the really high millions, if it was done as CM at risk. But 
the new building would be less expensive or about the same if we use the other methods, which we can with new. Um, on a how long would it take to get open? It's clearly, um, it's compared to new, we're going to wait longer. So that gets a less favorable to me. I mean, we just would, it's not going to open in 2026. It's much more disruptive. I think regardless of which site we pick, because we're trying to take part of the building apart while building a new part to it. So whatever we think about building next to the building, it feels more disruptive. It's marginally less energy efficient, Paul. You know, when you were saying, you know, we want it to be energy efficient, but at least the initial estimates we got, it's not a lot worse. It's, it's worse because we've got that big flat building. It uses... This footprint is not minimized. Um, and there's a lot more walking for the kids and the teachers within the building. To, and, and you can't as easily um, wall off community space at, at where the library is. So, so it seems to me to have some deficits at what, whichever site. And then when I looked at it on the sites, it fits really well on the Wildwood site. I mean, it kind of nestles right into the Wildwood site. And I think may avoid the need to build into the hill. Um, when I look at it on the Fort River site, however, um, and I was looking at the cost basis of cost, all the things that the design and, and engineers have done to avoid the water problems at Fort River by raising the a new building, they raise the foundation, they do all sorts of things with the, all the landfill around it to have the water run off the hill, make a hill, make a slope, um, they can't do with the reno part, and they're going to go deeply underneath it to try to, to address water. But that means the two buildings, one will be a bit higher than the other. And I think it's just the effort to do all of that doesn't seem worth it. And um, I, I'm a lay person, but I worry about the long-term risk of the building that's still sitting on the ground that wasn't lifted by this extra foot of dirt. So to me, I think Ad Reno is riskier when I look at Fort River, but I didn't have the same thought. So I just, that's me running down Ad Reno at the two sites. All right, what else? Uh, any, I don't see any hands up. Okay, uh, Angelica. Angelica has her hand up. Yep, good. Yeah, I, I wanted to say I agreed with Kathy's um, evaluations of Ad Reno. I had the same uh, thoughts um, about my concerns concern with the riskier nature of an ad reno versus a new construction. And I just wanted to add another um, concern that I had was about disruption and particularly disruption and the length of construction for our children with special needs who are already very sensitive to disruptions already, both sensory and in terms of just having to move from familiar um, you know, environments to like constantly be shifted around from environment to environment. And that's why I thought new is also going to be able to maximize one of the things that I weigh more heavily, which is the least amount of disruption and the duration for completion. So uh, for me, the new construction weights more heavily in that way. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan? I, I agree with both uh, Kathy and Angelica in their comments, um, you know, not just to, to avoid repeating their, their comments. You know, I, I think if we are thinking about a 50 year building and assuming that the next round of costs don't, you know, reflect a greater difference between ad, you know, addition and renovation versus new construction, I, I, I tend to, to uh, support a, a, a new construction over renovation. Okay, I don't see any hands, so maybe we can just keep going around the room. I'll, I'll kind of go in alphabetical order. Paul, any thoughts? I just want to clarify, are we making a decision about ad reno versus new construction? Are we trying to get that into a decision point at this point in time? Or I, I, what, I think it's an, it's an opportunity to, to provide comments and thoughts. Okay, so I agree with what everybody else said. Okay, uh, Simone. I'm in agreement with what everyone else said. I think the the new building uh, would be cheaper, would be faster, and least disruptive. Okay, thank you, Allison. 
I agree with what has been said. Ben? Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with what I've heard so far. I mean, if the, uh, if the ad rental option were half the cost of, of new construction, I, I think there are some potential trade-offs, but yeah, I don't, in terms of like, you know, disrupting learning time, these sorts of things in the, in the, uh, the span of construction, right? Like the timeline, I, I think the new option is probably the best option. So I, I concur. Okay, thank you. Sean? This may have already been said, but maybe Tim can just confirm it. I can't remember if Ad Reno met the town's EUI goals. I remember there was a chart that we looked at that had different EUI goals and some were able to hit those goals better than others. Um, maybe it's not the goals I'm thinking of. Maybe it's the, the measure that we needed to hit in order to get the incentives. Um, I, I don't remember if it was from Eversource, but there, were, there was a baseline we had to hit to get certain incentives. And I know some of the options didn't hit that baseline. Tim, can you uh, refresh my memory what I'm what I was thinking of? Sure. There is a slight difference between uh, new construction and renovation addition in terms of the EUI that we feel we'll be able to hit as projected now. Um, Reno Ad is doesn't perform well by a marginal amount, but the difference between Reno Ad and new construction is not as large as some of the other choices that will have to be made, for example, ground source versus air source. Okay. So that's the biggest that, difference in the yeah. options is there. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Phoebe. Um, so I, um, I'm, I'm feeling like I don't know necessarily enough about what our plan for ad reno would be. I don't think we've talked about it a lot. I mean, I see that there are some benefits. There's you know, maybe more area to put PV on the roof, those kinds of things. However, does that overshadow um, all of the other concerns that everybody else has raised? I, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know that um, without more of a concrete plan of how this would happen in place, um, I can really say one way or the other. My, my gut says you know, new is probably the way to go. Um, however, again, I don't know that everything's been explored fully. Um, I do, I think I'm, I'm with Angelica on the disruption piece. That is huge. Um, I, I have a kiddo who would have, he's, you know, not going to be affected by this, but who, if he had been at the time, this would have been a huge, huge, uh, deal for him. So that I think is very big. And I think that if, if the general consensus is that this would be more disruptive to our, to our kiddos, to our students, um, I think that sort of would be my deciding factor. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Tammy. Thoughts? Um, I think that everything I'm thinking is reflective of what's been said, in particular, um, the least disruptive to student learning um, in light of uh, COVID and time lost already. I would hate to put any anything else in jeopardy of student learning um, in terms of student learning. Okay. And um, Alicia, if you're in the room. Any thoughts? Yes. Um, so I also am echoing similar things that we've heard from everyone else. Um, I would like to also strongly emphasize the disruption for our students, um, especially students with special needs or other learning um, accommodations that are needed. But just any student, I think being in a building that's being worked on is going to be a huge distraction and disruption for the learning process. Um, but I but I do also agree that I, I feel like if I had to make a decision right now, I would say new also in terms of the long-term investment for our community. And if this is gonna be the building for a very long time, that's gonna house a majority of our students that I want it to be new, long lasting and not that we're gonna run into any issues. Um, but I also feel like I, I'm missing some pieces of information to feel very confident in that, like firm in that decision right now. Um, and one of those would be the cost estimate as well, but I, but I am more heavily leaning towards the new, um, construction. Okay. Um, 
I think everybody's had a chance to comment. Did Jonathan weigh in? Yes, okay. he did. Okay. Yeah, I'm just keeping notes, Paul, as, 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 as names went by here. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I think we've gotten some input there from everybody. So I would propose Phoebe, to move on Phoebe, to another- I'm sorry, Bob, Phoebe yeah, has her right. hand up. Oh, Phoebe, I'm sorry. Ben and Phoebe, okay, Phoebe. Uh, so I want to, um, it's come up a couple of times just in the last little bit. This is gonna sort of span the last two things we talked about. I think that, um, Paul, you brought up uh, today um, the idea of the fact that, you know, this building is going to be sort of what we have for the next 50 years kind of thing. And I think that's an important point. I think that we really need to think more about that as we go through the matrix and add reno decisions and all of those kinds of things, two and three story, all of that. Um, because there, there are pieces also that kind of go back to the future planning, not just of the building, but also of the town. Um, for instance, you know, if, if we're talking about, like you had mentioned, walkability, that kind of thing, um, what are we looking at in terms of new developments possibly going in um, that would make um, you know, future planning different, that would make walkability different? So I think that we have to also look at the longevity of this building and how things, uh, I think, look more than we have been at how that longevity will impact the community around each of these each of these sites. Um, you know, is there more more opportunity for community buildup or developments around Fort River, and therefore that sort of uh, makes the school closer to where things will be for the next 50 years, or is it more around Wildwood, that kind of stuff? I don't know that I said that well, but I hope everybody understands what I meant. Okay, uh, then it's Ben's turn. Yeah, so, so I, I just had like a small point. I realized it, it actually doesn't change my opinion on the ad reno option, but I, I just wanted to point out that the abatement is also a factor. Like these buildings were built at a time where hazardous materials were not necessarily known to be hazardous. And I realized that 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 actually affects, you know, which which site would be more preferable if ad reno were the option. One site would require considerably more abatement than the other. So I just wanted to put that out there. Ben, could you just say which site needs more? Remind us. It would be it'd be Wildwood. Okay. Okay. Um... I'm waiting to see if there's any more hands. And I don't see any. So I propose we move on to the next topic, which would be um, thoughts on the two sites. Um, Paul started to already touch on this, but um, would anybody volunteer to jump in and provide comments and start comments about the, about the sites? And again, it's not to decide on a site, it's just to uh, talk about you know, and discuss positives and negatives. Would anybody volunteer or should I go around the room? I, I, I'll, I'll try to prime the pump um, by starting out. <laughs> um, I wanted to go last, but I, I, I think, um, first I wanna say is I actually haven't decided on which side I prefer. Um, and I'm gonna try to talk a little bit through what I see as advantages and then uh, concerns or less advantage. and. Um, you know, toward what Phoebe was saying, um, she's not quite ready to decide yet. I just want to point out to everybody, we do have to decide. Um, so, you know, we're, so this part of this process is uh, weighing the pluses and minuses. And if, if it starts to be something just has more pluses, that ends up emerging. Um, so when I went through it, um, one thing I think we're lucky about in Amherst is we've got two ter terrific sites to choose from. Not everybody has that. It would be a lot easier if one just was, no way, I want a school there. Um, and Donesco has assured us that they can build on both for the type of building that we want that is achieving education goals, energy efficient, offsets energy. And both um, with our energy efficiency, I don't think we should look sight of that this new building and even the ad reno are going to save more than $250,000 a year in utility costs. I mean, that's at least that much money compared to the current building. So there's an operating cost. So I'll just go through the two 
the way I'm thinking about that. Wildwood to me is a totally beautiful location, the way it's nestled against the hill with walking trails to neighborhoods and the middle and high school. It's got access. It doesn't own the fields, but it's got access to the middle school fields. It's adjacent to town-owned conservation land. Um, and it's adjacent to uh, the, a Head Start program. Um, you know, I don't know to what extent they ever interact. At least the initial estimates, cost estimates, said it would be less expensive to build new there, but we don't have that updated. Um, I think, but we don't have good data on it, more children currently live within distances able to walk and more do walk. Um, and Phoebe's point that we there is future development in both sites, and actually UMass is reopening up 120 family things that will most likely have children since it's required that they have kids to be in them. Um, I couldn't see much difference. I was looking on equity. A very high percentage of low income and disadvantage are in Wildwood, high African American um, special needs. So it, again, they're not that much different. It's near a bus stop. It would be, I'm a North Amherst resident. It's the only elementary school in North Amherst, although it's not that far from the center of town. So it's a shade of gray on that. Um, it's on a hill and um, I keep thinking of water. And so the drainage issues, they're there, but you can drain downhill more easily than you can drain on a flat surface. It's not near wetlands or on wetlands or rare species. We have to, with the other site, um, go through CONCOM. And we're, we're gonna have to get permits. I think we'll be fine, but there's one less step in the regulatory process. So what's less favorable about Wildwood? It's pretty clear the first thing that jumps out at you, a lot less land. So we have less space um, to decide exactly where the school goes. There's um, less space for the construction equipment when it comes on site. There's less space for thinking about queuing and redesign of the way cars and buses go in and out. Um, we don't have the issue. Um, we would have the issue at Wildwood potentially of talking to the middle school about using that lower field as geothermal, although we don't think it's a, an issue. It's one step forward. Um, and there are traffic concerns, although when I get to the walk, there's a traffic concern at the intersection at Strong at, and Strong and East Pleasant, but those both look solvable to me. I mean, we have potential solutions, they just cost. So I'll jump to Fort River. Um, for me, the main issues on Fort, on Fort River because of its strong positives are water and traffic, um, favorable, is the opposite of Wildwood. It's big acreage. It really allows a lot of space for thinking about how you do the flow of traffic on the site, where you put the geothermal wells, staging for construction. It's right next to community fields as long as we include it in the improvement package. Um, lots of playing fields. It's near a bus stop. Both of them are near a bus stop. And if we don't choose it, I don't think the building is salvageable. So that is weighing on my, what would we do with that building? Um, you can't just move into it. So the less favorable to me is water um, and water tables and uh, Tim and Donna and everyone keeps telling me, don't worry about that. We can fix it, we can build on it. I, I worry about long-term rainfalls. They seem to be going up. Do I really know where climate change, it's not the flood, it's the flood, the, the low area. And then traffic, I'm not sure we can fix the traffic problem at Fort River. It's an F at the intersection and we could do a light there, but they're telling us it doesn't do much to fix it. We can't move the driveway um, because there's a sewer pump there. We can't easily even widen the street. We were told that that's a historic piece of green across the street, uh, federal and state. So I'm not sure we can fix the, so we would have to live with the traffic problem. I'm not saying it's insurmountable and I'll stop. Those are just my, um, and I, I think that makes it more difficult to walk to school, by the way, the, the walking, because the intersections are so scary. Um, you may, maybe parents can walk with their children to get across those intersections. So that's just me trying to think through the, and as I said, I, I don't come out with a therefore, I come out with a, I've got a choice. Um, and I think I think both are actually good choices. Okay, thank you, Kathy. I see Angelica's hand up. 
I think I have less of a list like that and, and more of some concerns that really stand out for me. I think for one of the biggest concerns for me that stand out between the two sites that I just want to generate a discussion is about traffic flows and to hear from, from others more about that concern because I have children in both schools um, currently and um, I know there's just a qualitative difference between uh, dropping off my daughter at Fort River and then dropping off my son at Wildwood. And that's a big concern, particularly if we are dealing with the issue of growth um, and also in terms of walking and, and also in terms for, you know, residents in that area, the amount of traffic that that will increase because that's already significant. So that's one issue. And I was interested to hear from Kathy about the issue about um, the salvageability of buildings. And I want to hear more about that because I know that one of the concerns about community access is not just access of the new building, but what will happen to that existing building. Um, and you mentioned that salvageability, but also Ben mentioned about abatement at Wildwood, which which kind of complicates my choice making. So I'll just raise those two issues right now. I have others. Okay, Phoebe. Um, what stands up for me at the very top is the outdoor space, whether that's outdoor learning, whether that's play space, whether <laughs> it's um, us having the opportunity to ensure that the town of Amherst doesn't lose access to the fields that are available at, at Fort River. Um, because while the middle school has some fields that may be used for uh, Wildwood children play, it, it, they're not as easily accessible for all, for everyone um, as those fields at Fort River are. Um, my mind goes to, you know, still coming off of a very difficult couple of years with COVID, um, the ability to have more space that we can easily shift to if needed for outdoors um, seems to be huge. I don't think that, um, uh, I don't know that uh, we can say with certainty we're not going to encounter another pandemic over the next 50 or so years. Um, and so to have places that we can shift to a little bit easier um, is sort of at the top of my mind. Um, I think that uh, for me, really hearing from people about what the future use is going to look like of these buildings is going to be big. Um, reason being, um, you know, it, it may make sense to have, you know, if, if we can get a community center or a BIPOC community center or something like that in one of these buildings, it may make sense to have closer proximity to the middle school and the high school. Um, and that obviously leans towards that, you know, us building a school on Fort River and, and leaving that, leaving Wildwood open for that. Um, I think traffic does have an impact, but my, my uh, big push in cost, of course, is always what, what is that going to look like if we're building a roundabout, if we have to do a second curb cut, or I, I think that that, I think we can't, I think that came up, um, you know, and I want to also say that we're going to have to deal, deal with traffic impacts um, down on Southeast anyway, regardless of where we build the school, um, because there will still be, if we're busing all the kids to one site or another, there is still going to be a significant increase in traffic on that street anyway. Um, so that to me is not a uh, sort of deciding factor one way or another. Um, I think, oh man, I have so many things. <laughs> um, let me leave it at that and I may raise my hand and, and want to come back. Okay. Sean, you're up next. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the usability of the building that we don't select, um, you know, it'd probably be best if Rupert or Mike or Ben weigh in on that. But my recollection from the capital plan is that either building is going to require a pretty large capital investment if we want it to continue into the future. Um, I believe both buildings have uh, aging roofs, aging HVAC systems, aging electrical systems. Um, and major accessibility improvements if we were to use it for, you know, whatever the, the different ideas that have been proposed. Um, so just keep that in mind that that's a large cost if that's the decision that the council um, decides to make. Um, and then in terms of the, the two sites, um, 
the thing I really like about the Wildwood site is the, the campus model. I know that was brought up earlier. Um, I live in Belchertown, they have a campus model. Um, I see the benefits every day where um, older siblings can help pick up their younger siblings or walk them to school or go pick them up after school. Um, it builds a nice community around that area. And I know we're looking to invest in that area. We're looking at improvements to the track and field. We're looking at improvements to War Memorial. Um, you've got the middle school pool there. Um, so to me, with the investments we're looking to make in that area, to have that campus model centered around that area would be really beneficial to the community. Okay, thanks, Sean. Mike, I see you joined the meeting. I did. I apologize that uh, other things got in the way this morning. Um, I was actually just going to ask, uh, I think I know where we are in terms of what we're discussing, but before I jump in with comments, I wondered if someone could just share uh, where we are specifically, because I do have thoughts based on the last couple of comments, but I, I you know, I, I want to make sure that uh, I'm understanding where we are in process. Well, at least at the moment, we, we had talked about um, the, uh, the decision making, uh, the matrix, um, and then we moved on to uh, asking the committee to share thoughts about um, add reno versus new. And everybody commented on that. And now we're talking about thoughts on sites. And again, just kind of uh, trying to get uh, input, not making a decision at this point, but trying to get input. Um, I see there's two other hands up. So I, I do have input to share, but I'll wait till after Phoebe and Alicia weigh in and I'll, I'll jump in at that point. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Okay. And then Alicia, it's your turn. Um, thank you. So a lot of what I had to say has already been sent, said already, because I think we're mostly just stating facts that we know about each and why that matters more to us. So I agree with everything that's been said, but for me, they weigh a little bit differently. Um, and I'd say that something that's really important to me is the the outdoor space and the playing space for children, um, which I also think also think makes the building, the possible future building, more um, accessible or able to accommodate different learning styles, different learning abilities. And so just having a lot more physical space on the site and outdoors. I'm also really heavily thinking about the pandemic and the possibility of future pandemics, um, specifically because my children and I did just have COVID last week. Um, and so that's like very heavily on my mind, how that can be accommodated and how to, to sort of be ahead of that in the future because again this is a long-term investment in our community that's going to be around for a very long time um, and we can't predict what type of trends we'll even see because we're still honestly in the midst of this current pandemic um that so that's one factor that's weighing very heavily for me um and then some other things that have been said that i've been thinking about um traffic is one of them traffic is terrible um i had children at fort river and the drop off was a little bit difficult, but they have an entrance and an exit. And so I worry about having double the amount of people and families going into Wildwood with one entrance and what that will look like um, and our inability to have additional parking spaces or just there's going to be a lot more traffic in and out there. Um, and so I worry what that will look like with double the amount of people coming in and coming out. Um, and then the other factor is walkability. I'm not so sure I consider honestly either of them to be quite walkable. Like to me, Wildwood is not very walkable. Um, and so I previously lived in North Village and my children went to Wildwood and that is way too far to walk. Like that's not walkable. Um, and that's where a lot of the, I mean, maybe from Village Park and Olympia Oaks, but I'm not sure how walkable that is. And Fort River also slightly not walkable, but they are getting ready to build the affordable housing right across the street. Um, they have Watson Farms, which is also right across the street and Colonial Village, which is right around the corner. There's a lot of dangerous intersections anywhere. So I think it will depend on what you're personally okay with for your kids as a parent. Um, and then the other thing that I'm thinking about in terms of the campus model is it doesn't really have as strong a pull for me. One, because then Crocker Farm is just completely left out of the mix and they're going to have a huge population of our elementary school students still going to school. And so I worry about how that will affect the kids that will be all the way in the corner and everyone else is congregated together. Um, also, my kids in elementary school 
I have all my kids in elementary school. My oldest will move into middle school and I'll have elementary school kids, but I don't really foresee them interacting in a school setting, like across like age groups and stuff like that. So I don't know that whole idea doesn't have as much pull for me. I also think about it more in terms of the use of the building that we don't use and why that makes Wildwood actually a better contender for any other option besides school, like any other services that we would be able to provide to the community or to the youth that high schoolers and middle schoolers might want to access. Um, or there's a, there's a early child care center across the street, um, more early child care centers, stuff like that. So those are like all of the things that I'm thinking, but I also like Kathy don't like, I, I mean, I think Fort river looks more favorable, but I also still think that I, I would like, I wish I had more time and more information. So thank you. Okay. Um, Phoebe, you have some follow-up comments? I do. Um, so I, I uh, don't, I think that I want to stress again, very heavily the disruption of the construction. It's not just the actual physical building going up, um, but it's all of the construction vehicles. It's the construction workers. I mean, it's all of that. And that is hugely disruptive. And on a larger site, it becomes a little bit less disruptive to have um, a separate entrance and exit. You know, maybe we can manage the disruption a little bit uh, better than on Fort River than if we were on Wildwood. Um, I think on-site traffic, so not even, you know, sort of, I already mentioned uh, getting to the schools, but on-site traffic, I think uh, having the ability to have the separate entrance exit um, is going to be um, uh, very helpful when we're talking about an increase in buses, an increase in parent drop-off, all of those sorts of things. Um, I think looking at the proximity of uh, parking lots to play areas in the future um, is is also going to be uh, something that we should we should really pay attention to and sort of uh, would be better at uh, Fort River because of the because of the layout because of the um, space, all of that. Um, and um, I think that having everything sort of contained on the site leads uh, toward to Fort River being a better option in terms of the geothermal wells, all of that. I understand that um, we can, you know, we, we, there's a lot of sway or, or maybe it's easy to come up with a plan with the regional school committee. Um, I also recognize that a lot can change in 50 years. Um, so in terms of looking at the future, I think if everything is contained on its own site, um, one that, you know, the town of Amherst ultimately has, has that control over, I, I think it's just a, a better option. Thank you. Okay, uh, Allison, would you like to comment next? Yeah, I, I have to, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, um, I personally, just for my own selfish reasons, I prefer the Fort River site because I don't want to deal with the construction here at Wildwood since that will be impacting my life. But um, in terms of what I think would be beneficial for children at this point in time. I do think the Wildwood site, uh, a campus model would be nice. And I also think that um, it just feels like a safer set setting. You know, if I have a, a safety situation here, I can understand how to manage it better because of the minimal traffic that we have to deal with. Um, we have this very nice contained way of how the hill is and how you have the other campuses where if there, there's a child who is being unsafe, they don't have very far that they can go, that there's not a person that we can get to help that child. Um, I, I, in Fort River, with the, with the expanse of land and the traffic the way it is, it just feels to me like it would be harder, but that's just what, how I feel now. Okay. <clears throat> Mike, that leaves you with a hand up. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think uh, I think like some other people said, still weighing options. Um, I think the the revised layout <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks at Wildwood has made me feel more optimistic about the green space there and the the access to that. Um, so thank you to our architect team. 
In terms of Fort River, I feel really good, uh, thanks to the architecture team about the buildability of the site. You know, I think there've been lots of concerns expressed about that. Um, I'm not a geotech expert, but I trust the folks on our team to give us accurate information. If they say they can build there, I'm on board with the uh, capacity to build there. I think that the two things I'd wanna say about the Fort River site, um, one is that I think I agree with the comments about there is more green space and more usable green space because it's flat. I also want to stress that green space needs to be improved. Having more green space that puddles when it when it sprinkles is not particularly helpful green space. So I think if we're serious saying that we want to have more green space and we want to use the Fort River site, there's going to need to be an investment as the architects kind of originally designed in improving the fields so that they're accessible to, even when it rains uh, the next day that they're accessible because they're not right now, right? And that's been a long standing thing from when I was a teacher there 15 years ago, they weren't. And things haven't improved in terms of how much rain we get in Massachusetts, nor in terms of the site issues. So, uh, you know, I think for, for, for folks advocating on that realm, I hope they also advocate for the financial investment to improve the fields there. Because I think if, if we're talking about green space, we're talking green space. And, you know, I think that the thing that gets sort of left out, and I wasn't in much of the meeting, but is the Hawthorne property, which is adjacent to Fort River, adjacent to Wildwood has a lot of potential um, for additional green space, for trails, for outdoor education. So I think in terms of direct accessibility, the Fort River site definitely has more green flat land, uh, but that green flat land needs to be usable and to be usable, it's gonna need a significant financial investment. Um, and I think shortchanging that financial investment and saying that we have additional green space is, is inconsistent with how I view the situation. I think the other thing I want to share about Fort River is the traffic. Um, I'm not a traffic expert. I know what an F is, right? I was a teacher. Uh, I know what an F rated, uh, what that means. And um, I think for, for me, whether the schools there or Wildman makes a huge difference because yes, that'll always be a busy intersection, but it won't be a busy intersection if we don't build there that we'll have cars and buses and vans leaving and coming every day. So. To me, there needs to be a similar investment at Fort River in figuring out a better way to do traffic. And that, that may involve, you know, really changing uh, the land, the layout. It could, I, I'm not an expert, but something would have to shift for us, for me to feel better about 575 students. Because it's one thing to drive through that intersection on your way to work, on your way to drop off kids. It's another thing to drive through that intersection while there's buses and vans and cars all leaving or dropping off with kids. So, you know, the, the, I'm not a traffic expert. I know a, a C is better than an F, right? Uh, and, you know, so those are the things that weigh on me about Fort River. I'm not opposed to it philosophically. I'd have no vested interest in being one place or the other. I'm actually probably, I think I said this in a public meeting a while ago, I'm probably more flexible than most on this question, but the impact of the fields and the improvement of the fields and improvement of the traffic is something that to me feel like non-negotiables if we're gonna go down the Fort River Road. That's not a, like a straw argument or a false argument. Like if, if those conditions can be resolved, I see a lot of upside, but they need to be resolved and there's gonna to have to be a financial investment to resolve them. Thank you. Okay, Tammy. All right, sorry. Obviously, we have space issues today. Um, that's why I'm in the hallway in the office. Um, I guess I just want to uh, just agree to um, some of what's already been said already. Uh, as it relates to the traffic, I mean, I, I leave here sometimes as late as 6.30 at night, and I still have issues getting out. So I think, and I've also done um, crosswalk duty, and the level of traffic, and how fast people drive, and you know, I think we can all agree that there's a lot more distracted driving these days. All of those things have me really concerned, and I don't know um, if and how the town will resolve those issues if the site at Fort River is chosen. Um, and it sounds like there are issues beyond, um, it, it makes it less feasible to get the F to, to a higher grade. Um, when I think about the greenery, I, I would appreciate that. But again, um, having been out in the field both during the winter um, and in the spring, those fields are, are just, can be really dangerous at times, especially because the high level of ice and the amount of water that kids end up getting, that kids end up getting soaked. Um, and so those are, that's, that's real. 
Um, and finally, um, also being from Belchertown, I, I do like the campus field. I think that there's a lot to be said for that. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, you have some comments? I do. Um... So one of the things that I would like to hear, there's a couple of things I'd like to hear from people on, and maybe not at this meeting, but one is the if there are operational efficiencies or is it um, in terms of um, staffing, uh, you know, a, a contiguous site versus a separate site, and also Angelica, you had mentioned about your two, you have you have direct experience dropping off kids. I mean, you and I didn't know what that what that meant. So if you could expand on that, I would really appreciate that. Um, I think uh, Phoebe made a good point about the laydown area. I mean, the sort of construction area having a lot more space makes it a lot more easier to, um, you know, at, at at Fort River, you can space things out. So laydown area. Um, but as I think about these things, I sort of think sort of short term, like what's the one two year impact, and then the what's the forty eight year impact if we're looking at 58, 50 years. One of the things I really would like to explore a little bit more. Um, is or two things actually well one thing in particular is is i think walk again i'm sort of settling more on walkability and I, it would be helpful to me if if the two leaders of the two schools you probably know what family what children walk to school and um how many there are in in each of your and that's probably going to change dramatically there will be additional housing adjacent to fort river um but you probably know there's x number of kids who walk to school and what i would be interested to know is um because if wherever, whichever building we don't use, those kids, those people will now not walk to school. I'd like to know if, is there a way to contact or talk to those parents who have, parents and guardians who have children who are walking to school and what what it would mean to them? That would be, um, because that is going to be something. And if those people don't live there at the, they, you know, kids grow up, they move or something, there'll be somebody else probably in that same situation. So existing people who walk to school um, how many are there at each of the buildings? And then what um, what do those families think about that? I'm not sure if there's a way to survey that or if you have any, uh, any clue about what that means. Um, and I think the only other point I'd like to make is about the future use of a building. Um, right now, there's no funds ass assigned to um, field improvements at Fort River or to future use of either building. Um, and we know that there's many of the uses that people would like uh, a school is not conducive to using it. For instance, a senior center, um, many, you know, I, we had a meeting last night with members of the uh, senior center advocacy group who are saying a school is not conducive to a senior center because it's built as long hallways. And that's the last thing seniors want is long hallways with rooms off of it. So I think we have to be careful about saying, oh, we could use it for this or that. I, you know, in many ways, um, I see it almost as a liability to the town when we get a, an unused building in front of us, because uh, each building is going to require millions of dollars of investment that we just don't have. So those are my points is like, is there any operational efficiency, um, walkability? Um, and I, I really don't know how to factor in future use of the buildings, but just to sort of take away the idea that, oh, this we can just turn this building into this thing or the, that thing. We're learning very quickly that that kind of decision is a multi-million dollar decision. Okay, thank you. A uh, couple of other people want to comment. I just want to point out it's about five after 10 and we want to leave some time for public comment. And we also want to come back, I think, and talk about uh, upcoming meetings. So, uh, Ben? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep keep it as brief as I can here. Um, yeah, what, one thing that I want to point out is that, that like I, I heard the term uh, non-salvageable in regard to one of the buildings. Neither are non-salvageable. Okay. Well, I think it comes down to the, the term, is the juice worth the squeeze, right? One of them will cost more in terms of abatement. Both of them have new boilers. One, with Wildwood being the newer of the two. Fort River just recently, last summer, had uh, a little over $100,000 worth of roof work done, but both would still need new roofs, so... I mean, I, I've argued it both ways in my head as to which one would be better to leave to the town, but also selfishly, I'm here representing the school committee, so that's not necessarily my concern. So my concerns are Wildwood for a positive, one of the positives I would say is the proximity to the other schools, not just the other schools, but 
the proximity to, and this is in my day job that I would think about this, proximity to the maintenance department, right? The it's it's quicker and easier to get there to, to for an emergency repair if we had to, right? That's one simple thing that I, I've thought about. The other thing I've thought about is like location equity, if, if I'm making up a term or whatever, but we would have elementary schools bookending our town rather than to have one more centrally located and then another one more southern, south located, I guess you, you would say. So that kind of factors into which one I find to be more favorable. The positives I have for Fort River are like the space, space, and more space, but that also actually kind of like syncs up with one of the negatives that I have, which is the, uh, the amount of site work it's a larger site that's going to need extensive site work. So with, without seeing the actual costs, like I would think that it would be more expensive to raise the overall grade at a larger property by two feet versus one feet at the, the school site, if, if I'm reading that right. There's, the other positive is that it, it is kind of tucked in behind the other, uh, you, have, you have other properties in front, right? And, and so it's kind of out of the way. You have like sort of a natural buffer from the, the road there, but that's my main concern when it comes to the Fort River site. So having done crossing guard duty at both schools, I will say that like the, the I'm gonna use a real technical term here, but the sketchier of the two sites in terms of crossing people, right? And that factors into walkability is Fort River. That is, it's absolutely terrifying to try to get kids across that street safely. And so, so and I also wanna add that like getting kids across, uh, across well down and across uh, Pleasant Street there, that's not, much better, but but yeah, yeah, Fort River, that, that four-way intersection is very hard to traverse, which which also factors into the usability if we're talking about using it as a youth center as well. You know, that I'm I'm still concerned with those kids in, in terms of that, which actually makes the Wildwood site better for a youth uh, uh, youth center, right? Because you would just walk across a campus here and chestnut's not that hard to cross from the high school. But yeah, in, in terms of uh like the traffic factor there, that's, what's, that's what gets me the most at the Fort River site. I mean, I, I have to travel in and out of those, both properties multiple times a week. And I, my, my work vehicle is a little bigger than a golf cart. And it's still very hard to, to get onto Main Street and go left, right? Like you're, you're, it's like playing that game Frogger or Froggy. I, I forget what that was, but where you have to cross multiple lanes. So that, that makes it less favorable for me, but I mean, to be honest, I could kind of go either way. I see positives in each and I see negatives in each. To me, it really is going to come down to cost factor. Hey, thank you. Uh, Angelica, you have follow-up comments? Yeah, so I follow up with uh, Ben's comments about traffic and because Paul asked me to elaborate more. So I like your technical use of sketchy because that's how I feel when I'm turning into get out of Fort River after picking up both my kids in the afternoon if we have to make either a left or right, it's sketchy even in a car to try to figure out with the buses coming also in and out of that way. Cause the, even though there's two ways to get in, to get out in the afternoon, the flow is still through that way. And then you're also, when you're trying to turn to get in and pick up your kids, you have to watch out for the kids crossing. So there's a lot of factors versus at Wildwood. When we're driving to go to Wildwood, you have Southeast, you have a longer way, then you turn to go to Wildwood. So that's a longer way that you're not sort of bunched up to get there. And there's one only entrance, but at the same time, it just doesn't have that so many, like it's not a huge intersection to get in. And then there's the other way you can get in through Strong Street. So sketchy, yes, definitely. But I'm also still undecided. Um, and one of the things I would like to know more is to specify further the category about disruption and to understand because that's something that I personally weigh heavily is the disruption on kids. And one of the factors is something raised that Allison raised about well, you know, in terms of the disruption, I'd like to know what are the plans um, in place and whether there's a difference in terms of disruption for given the spaces of the two sites, given that there's more space at Four River and less space at Wildwood. And I raise my concern um, because in um, all in both sites, there are um, programs for students with special needs, but Wildwood has a program for students with intensive learning needs who are most sensitive to disruption. So that is certainly a concern. And then the last issue that's weighing heavily on me is also future use of site. Now I understand, you know, that there's um, certainly investments that would need to be made. Um, and, and there's a difference between a senior center, um, you know, and a BIPOC center. I think, you know, for a BIPOC center, you certainly hallways and things like that would be fine. And I just want to continue to have the discussion about 
the sites uh, and what uh, factors you know would be involved in the potential salvageability of one site versus the other, um, and you know, as a mitigating thing to decide because future use is important um, on that. So I'll stop there. Okay, I still see hands up from uh, Alicia and Jonathan has returned to the meeting. So Alicia. Um, thank you. I just have a few follow up comments mostly. Um, and one is that because I said my personally, one of my highest weighing factors is the fields and the space. Um, and I believe that and like being acknowledging the investment that that would include, but the fields being treated is included in the basis of design. So that will be included in the cost estimate that we get back. And I think it was also mentioned from Danisco that both sites will have considerable site work. Um, and so again, that's why I, I keep saying that I would like to have some more information because I, I also think cost is very important. And so we'll be making a significant investment either which way. And so I think it's really about like, what are we willing to apply the money for? What we think is most important. And so I'm looking to see those things. Um, and then in terms of walkability, I, I agree with Paul and I think it would be really helpful to see how many um, walkers we have from each site. Um, but one other piece of information that I think would be helpful for me is to know the reason why they walk. So if they walk just because the school is close or if they walk because they don't have alternative transportation will be something that would be really helpful for me to know. Um, and then I, I also agree that Fort River traffic is really sketchy. Um, again, I, I have previously also had kids at Fort River and Wildwood um, and drop off. Um, I was, yeah, it's just sketchy either way you put it. You're gonna have to figure out um, an accommodation for the Fort River, but it has two entrances, Was it, which is the only reason why it is um, appealing to me. Cause I think maybe there's something else we can do there. I, I don't really know. Wildwood just worries me because of the increase in traffic that we would have in one entrance. And right now it might be workable, but again, we're like doubling the amount of people in the one entrance and there's another school building that uses the same entrance. Um, and when I was entering, I was coming from North Village, so the other way and children crossing the street there and people coming down that big hill is also an issue, especially because it's close to UMass and students in town and all of those things. That's an, another um, heavily traveled road in the morning. So I think either way, traffic is gonna be a heavily weighing factor. Um, and then the site that's not used, I think that's like another important part of the decision and also a little bit tricky because again, like Paul said, that's really sort of in the purview of the council. But I think in general, we can acknowledge that there's a lack of town property. Um, and we've been talking about this on the council a bit. Um, and so I, I think it would be really wise for us to have this conversation because there could be some importance in, in making sure there's available town property for, for future endeavors of the town. Um, and thinking about how that will affect the overall town budget, like aside from just the elementary school building um, itself. Um, and so I think that that's another important conversation that maybe the council should be having. Um, and then, and that maybe their decision would affect our decision. Um, and then also, again, just emphasizing what Angelica said about the disruption, because that is another thing really at the top of my list that I would like to know more about. Okay. Um... Jonathan, if you can uh, work in your comments quickly. I think we're kind of running short on time. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll be very quick. I, I, I think everyone has done an excellent job of kind of surfacing the issues um, that, and some of which are kind of cross purposes about choosing the sites. Um, I have no doubt that a, a school could be successfully built on either site. Um, and for me, a lot of it's really gonna come down to uh, the costs. Um, because I have I have not made a, a decision in my own head about which one I think is preferable. Um, and and I'd like to see the final traffic reports. I don't think we've seen that yet and just see if there's anything there that you know kind of uh, suggests something different than what was in the draft. Probably not going to be the case, but um, for me, it's really how how does cost impact a lot of the the issues that have been raised this morning? And uh, Thank you. And with that, I'm probably going to have to leave because there's a long queue of buses here at, at Cold Sturbridge Village, and I'm sure the Fort River bus is somewhere in here. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, so I think that's I think that wraps it up. I think we've gotten a lot of input, and um, 
Kathy, do we want to come back and talk about the upcoming meetings? So I, I see that Phoebe's hand is up. Um, Bob, if Phoebe, if you can be fairly short, because very I want quick, to, because I think this is a terrific conversation. So go ahead. Yes, very quick. Um, so I, I want to have a understanding in the future um, more about cost. So I want to understand, you know, if we're talking about regardless of site for you know, a million dollars one way or another, what does that mean to the town? I don't know that I have a good sense of that. I think that that's an important conversation when we talk about cost. Um, and and then I, I would like to understand what the options might be for the unused site, whichever one that is. Uh, would there be an option to sell it, to lease it, to use it as a community resource, what those are. So I don't need to know any of that now, but if we could prepare that for future meetings, that would be great. Okay, Bob, I'll, I'll take it back from you now. Um, okay, thank you. So um, looking at our timeline, um, we're gonna get a lot of information at the next meeting about costs, you know, that I've got. So some of what Phoebe is asking for is other kinds of costs in addition that that beside the, the project costs. Um, and I, I think that would be a good discussion. I think we're going to need another meeting between June 3rd and June 13th, um, because we have to go from getting that cost information, continuing this discussion. So two questions on the third, if people could uh, be do 8.30 to 11, we would have a chance of really starting to um, do more of what we just started to do. And I'd say, I don't think this is an easy decision, but take that matrix we have and whatever you want to do with it. You know, if there's some lines that you say, I can't begin to compare these, they, they seem the same to me, or I have no information, skip that line, but start to fill it out. And I was thinking you could fill it out any way you want, like with <laughs> colored pencils, so we can come together to, to say, I'm leaning more in one direction or another because of, you know, whatever, because um, we're going to have to decide. So th those are the two issues of using that matrix because um, we, we, we do have a hard deadline. I just want to impress on people. If we can't get to a decision for Danisco to write a preferred option report, we miss a whole cycle of MSBA. And we're no longer talking about 2026, you know, in terms of the, the staging of this. So it's an uncomfortable deadline, um, maybe, but uh, I think I have more information than I ever dreamed I would have at this point, and maybe that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, so, and so I just want to, um, I'll, I'll send out a poll on making it, and Angelica, I know you've said June is kind of out for you in participating, but if you at least take a stab at filling out the matrix, maybe, you know, it can be a way of, of being part of this. And Jonathan asked about the final traffic study. We did file it, Danisco sent it, but I may not have made it clear. It is in this week's packet and I'll just do a, a link to everyone. So that 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 has been reported out to it. It came, it came to us at the same time all the cost basis of cost estimating came to us. Um, so um, I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to put everyone on the spot right now because I can't offer you dates and I don't know whether morning times are good, but that week of the 9th is what I'm looking at. And there's for us on, on the council, I don't, you know, we have a, we don't have a meeting that week. You know, for me, the days are kind of open because um, other than the council meetings and finance, but a lot of you have real jobs. So I'll just try to send out a piece. When people agree we need another meeting before we have to make a decision. Um, I just nod heads or yeses. Yeah. Okay, so I will send out from some dates for that. Um, any other comments or questions before I use our time? I know we had... Uh, uh, I don't think I remembered, Sean, to put um, invoices on this. So we're going to have to catch up with invoices on the June 3rd meeting because I didn't post it as part of the agenda. So is it all right for everyone for me to move to opening it up for public comments? Yes, I'm th seeing a thumbs up. Okay, we are open for public comments. If people can 
raise their hands and I see three hands, four hands, one, two, three, four, five, five hands are up. And I, I just want to alert people, you know, I'm sorry for the tightness, but Paul and, and uh, Sean have to leave. So we're at risk of losing a quorum if we go too long. So try to keep your comments as uh, concise as possible. And we will be happy to get um, written comments. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to bring them in or should I? Sure. I can do it. Okay. Do it. Thank you. I brought in um, uh, ho okay. Hollow Lord already. Uh, she had her hand raised. I tried bringing in Pam, but she didn't um, come over. I'll try it again. Okay. okay. So Hala, you you're with us. Yes, thank you. Two quick things. I heard um, it mentioned that both sites have bus stops, but I want to point out that they're not equivalent at this time because one has a bus stop every 20 minutes and the other is just hourly. And then the second comment is on the slide, bases of design corridors and toilets. Um, they talked about individual rooms that, and I'm wondering if that's referring to the gender inclusive bathrooms. I understand from a different building project here in town that including gender inclusive bathrooms has budgetary and complete implications. So I'm wondering if that sentence is um, regarding gender inclusive bathrooms and could it be, or does it need to be clear for the cost estimators? Thank you very much. Thank you, Hala. All right, Pam has been brought in. Pam, you're with us if you unmute, yeah. Oh, okay, great. I, I thought Hala was still speaking. <clears throat> I was I was uh, listening to the conversations about the the various sites, and I'm delighted to see that you've got some sort of primary weighted factors. Uh, one of the thing that was going through my mind as uh, as a previous construction manager is that uh, some of the concerns expressed were uh, the impacts to the children and staff during construction, and I was looking at the site plans of Wildwood where. Uh, just given the, the narrowness of the site and the hillside that uh, even with a three-story building at Wildwood, the construction would be exposing literally half of the classrooms during the entire construction season or period to the construction noise and, and visible activity. So that's... Um, that's a major impact to the students, but but it also occurred to me that that means that literally all of their outdoor play space is also occupied for the entire duration of the period. So if it's a year and a half or three semesters of school, um, that's a pretty severe impact to the kids at, at Wildwood. Um, ultimately, I was looking at Wildwood thinking that even with a three-story building, there there is no flexibility for growth. That was someone else's um, uh, weighted factor uh, without losing much, if not most of, of any remaining outdoor playing space. So these are just sort of the short and long-term impacts to students that occurred to me as you were all speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Sean, you're doing this, correct? Yep. Uh, Chris is coming in. Okay. Chris, you're here if you unmute. Hello. Um, the, uh, my comments are all about the, uh, the, the specifications for the building. We didn't talk about that at this meeting. Is that, is that in order or not? At this time, I'm asking you, Kathy. You, can I can I summarize my the, the, the if you summarize quickly? The, I did forward your uh, email, but yeah. So quick, and then feel free to also give us written comments. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, uh, energy budget. There there is in the bylaw a requirement for an agreed upon energy budget, which. Um, uh we have not which hasn't happened that i don't think it's happened at least in, to the degree that it was contemplated when we were writing the bylaw so um i would like to call everybody's attention to the description of energy budget uh that is supposed to be established early on and certainly should be part of this 
package. We have a EUI target, and that could be said to be an energy budget, but uh, that certainly wasn't what we, we thought about when we were writing the bylaw. Um, there is no air tightness standard cited in the bylaw. Uh, air tightness of that could, an air tightness standard and air changes per hour could be established, should be established, and so that it would be targeted under, for uh, a blower door tests, multiple blower door tests during construction. Ener no, no air tightness standard. Um, uh, generally, my reaction to the specs on the building itself, the construction of the building, is that it's a pretty ordinary steel frame concrete building um, with no particular re remarkable energy construction, I'm sorry, energy conservation aspect to it. Um, particularly, there's no discussion of embodied carbon or embodied energy. And so we have a steel frame and concrete building, which has a terrible embodied energy numbers. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, just a couple more items. One is that uh, what the, comparing air source to ground source, source, both are viable options, but there's a couple of um, arguments in, uh, having to do with refrigerant gas there that would argue against um, the air source compared to the ground source. Um, uh, I won't go into those, but I, I, the refrigerants are very bad for the, when, when, if they leak, they're terrible for the, for the environment, tell for, terrible for, for uh, carbon change, uh, climate change. And we need to have control over, uh, it argues in favor of, that the refrigerant gas question argues in favor of the ground source. Um, and we, we talked about, there's a mistake on the gas fired uh, hot water heater that's mentioned in the spec and Donna mentioned that, but, um, uh, the actually what we what we should probably do would be to consider um, point of use uh, uh, demand on demand uh, hot water at at the, at the uh, plumbing fixtures themselves at least uh, for the bathrooms. Um, let's see. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you to send it in writing because some of what you're talking about would be in the next stage of schematic design. Um, you, yep. know, we, you know, um, once we have a where we're doing it, all of this, um, as you know, we haven't had another net zero. All of this will have to be addressed. Um, so maybe if you can get it to us in writing so we make sure that each of these issues are kept in front of us, that would be great. Well, I did get it to you, didn't I, yep. Kathy? Yeah, answer. you did. You did. And I'm just going to say that Donesco does have it. So it's not that it was forgotten. It's more what fits for this, um, this piece. No, what Donna said earlier, there is, it's being priced for um, certain things, but those are going to be flexible on, on the pieces when we actually um, make the decision. We haven't made a decision in, in HVAC yet, and we don't have to make it now. Okay, thank you. Sarah's in the room. Um, Kathy, Paul is going to leave right now so he can head to the next thing. I'm going to stay for another five minutes. Just I think you'll still have um, quorum, correct, if I stay? Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you. Sarah, us, you, yeah. you have joined us. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Sarah Marshall here. Um, I, I didn't see a lot of detail in the matrix um, about cost, just really a line for total cost. But I hope you will um, elaborate on that because it's, I think residents are not just concerned about the total project cost, but also what is potentially reimbursable by MSBA and what is not, what is going to be born, what are the potential additional items that uh, Amherst might have to pay for, um, not just for the project, but perhaps desirable other things like changes to street design, those would be entirely on us. And as well as um, maintenance costs over time or for the capital replacement, like if you do this versus that, um, it's not just, unless you're incorporating all of that into total cost, I don't really know. Um, anyway, just to say there's 
a lot of um, a lot of information in cost that should be surfaced besides just what's the total bottom line. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Maria has been brought into the room. Maria, you are in the room. Thank you. Um, I want to bring up several points. There is no field, no open field in the white in the wildwood design. There's no grassy areas. There's there's constructed play space building and a lot of parking and roads and those uh, queues, those roads, those parking are right adjacent to that play space. That is not the case at Fort River. Those what those beautiful fields are a, an amazing asset and a necessary asset to the kids that are going to be using the school and they're a very necessary asset to the town and absolutely yes we need to invest in those fields that those fields if go, please go there on any evening those are occupied by multiple different groups both informal informal and formal using those fields and all of our fields in town need better drainage we should fix them and we should seek other sources to help us fix them because a lot of that is the responsibility of the town um, there, we need the building. We need the other building that is not going to be a school for town uses. And it's not just senior center. And by the way, the senior center would not be using the entire 82,000 square feet and wouldn't have to be traversing long hallways. They could enter and use some of the very nice, large 2000 square foot rooms and cafeteria. There's a ton of other programs that need space. The BIPOC Youth Center, Youth Empowerment Center. If we get Build Back Better funds ever, we can build a proper uh, early education center that could serve zero to five-year-olds, which is in desperate need of, of space. And there are no spaces. The town council talks has been talking recently. There are no places that exist. We cannot lose this asset for the town. Um, and there is not going to be any new construction. We still have two other major uh, projects to build. We have a DPW, we have a fire station. Nobody's gonna be building new space anytime soon. Wildwood is much more amenable to immediate reuse. Its roof is in better shape and it doesn't need an immediate replacement. It, the abatement that Ben was talking about, that is if you demolish. If you demolish, you have to abate for the, uh, for the asbestos. But if you reuse it, reuse that building, you do not have to do that. Its proximity to, the, to downtown and to the middle and high school is much more amenable for all of these community uses that need a space. And honestly, uh, as the parent of kids that went to Crocker Farm, I'm really disturbed by all this talk about a campus model. 40% of the elementary school families are going to be attending Crocker Farm. They will not be at this new building. So that is, and there is, there was no discussion of this during the educational programming piece. That, there's, there's nothing in here about a campus in that, about a campus model. I, that to me is an argument being used to select the Wildwood space over the Fort River space. That is a, that is a false argument. Um, the traffic, yes, you should fix it. The traffic study said that these are solvable issues and there are things that you can do and there are ways to divert the, uh, the cars so that they're, the, they talked about this they're going to be the cars are going to be exiting heading south on the on that south entrance you've got two roads in and out of this site at fort river you do not have that and the things that you don't have at wildwood you cannot manufacture you cannot get that field the kids are not going to be using and especially kids that have mobility issues there is no way to get down to those middle school fields the ramp would be too long they've already talked about that as not being possible kids need to be outside we should be outside we need those fields if you pick if you don't pick fort river for the school that asset of the town and for the students is going to be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, and I think we have 
Sean, one more person. Uh, or... Rudy's been brought in. Um, maybe if, if they could keep their comments to two minute, a minute or two minutes. Yeah, just if some... you could just because we are a couple of people have to leave, Rudy. Sure. Thanks. Um, I, I have to say I started off uh, biased towards Wildwood, I think, a little bit. My youngest son went to that school K through six, and maybe I was just familiar. And I think I also bought the arguments about Fort River having all these problems with the soil and the groundwater and poor drainage and so forth. And two things really changed my perspective. One is actually reading the reports about uh, Wildwood and realizing that Wildwood had essentially the same problems, like slightly different, but essentially the same with soil structure, drainage, and so forth. And that made me start thinking about it anew. And secondly, I, my, my youngest son is now on the ultimate, one of the ultimate teams, and I'm over there four nights a week at Fort River, and I see what a tremendous community asset those fields are. Multiple teams using them, multiple families using the space, and I worry that if we don't pick that site, it's very likely to be sold for development, which would be a terrible loss to the town. The asset of Fort River, the, from the school perspective, the size of the fields is beneficial for future growth, for flexibility of positioning the building, for the geothermal fields, which we won't know where they actually need to go until we do test wells. There's a lot of underground issues that are gonna affect it, and to have more room to maneuver those geothermal fields is a big asset. Outdoor learning is going to be better opportunities at Fort River. And two entrances is a plus if we can fix the traffic. And I, I agree that traffic, the two main things that are keeping me from final judgment on this are the cost issues and the resolution of the traffic at Fort River and at Wildwood. But in terms of a campus model, my son was at, at Wildwood and never got taken to, um, to, to the middle school. So I don't see any uh, big advantage from the student's perspective anyway for the, the campus model for the elementary school. Um, so one last thing that if they could, if Danisco could explain at some point why the perched water table, just a little point, it needs drainage under the slab whereas a regular water table doesn't, I'm still mystified by that. And um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the costs info and the traffic info, but I think Fort River right now is, um, is a much better site. If I was a developer looking at this, I would say flat, two entrances, giant, wildwood, you've got slopes, you've got a single entrance, it's cramped, it's a cramped site, that's not the one I would consider the more valuable site. Thanks. Thank you, Rudy. And Tony, you are. Thank you, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Um, thanks for this robust discussion. I would agree with the committee members that weighted heavily the need for green space for children and considering the disruption during the two years of construction. The Fort River fields will be improved as part of this project. So that is a benefit of selecting that site for the school. It looks like, like as Maria said, there would be no flat green playing field at Wildwood. Uh, regarding disruption, at Wildwood, the proposed location for a geothermal well is where the parking lots and access roadway are now. Assuming the drilling takes longer than two months from start to finish and the scheduling doesn't perfectly line up with the summer, where would staff park during the installation of the well field and where would buses and parents drop off? And where would children play during two years of construction? Because the location for a new building at Wildwood is where the main playground and playing field is now. Where would contractors lay down? And would they have to be moved multiple times as was suggested by Donna at one of the public forums? Consider the square feet of paving versus the play space at each site. Currently, Wildwood has 105 parking spaces. The proposal is now to add 70 more spaces, which incidentally is more than had been proposed in the previous proposal in 2016, which was for 175 more students than this school. Regarding the remaining school, it seems that Kathy, Paul and Sean all indicated they are not committed to saving Fort River if it were not chosen for the school. If that is the case, that needs to be clearly explained to the public so that people can be made aware what you are proposing you mentioned the expense that would be needed to repair the remaining building, but how does that compare to the cost of having to purchase another property and build a senior center from scratch or a youth center? 
I would imagine reusing the Wildwood School building would be significantly less expensive than building a new somewhere else. And lastly, that vacated school building can be used for swing space for future projects, something that's sorely lacking right now, as well as to de-densify the school populations in the case of future pandemics. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, I want to thank everybody very much, um, including the people who just commented. We have a lot of people who have stayed with us um, and then some throughout the entire process. So if um, I'm hoping people will take the matrix home with them um, as a homework assignment, um, as I said at the initial, and I clearly misspoke about the Fort River building as being unsalvageable. It's not unsalvageable. It just needs an investment. And Paul made that point. They both buildings would. So I will send out once I uh, do, particularly for the people who have jobs, find some time slots that might work. Um, Mike, I know whether you missed this, but trying to find a time the week of the ninth for a one hour discussion, which would continue this. So we could be more comfortable getting to a yes on the 13th um, when we have all the pieces. And I think that is it, unless anyone has any final comment, in which case raise your hand. I don't see any, and Bob Stevens, I want to thank you for jumping in um, to the Amherst world. You did a, a heroic, <laughs> heroic job of keeping us on task and making sure we all had time to speak. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>